Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Olga Ceran and I'm an expert for scientific contacts uh, at the Polish Academy of Sciences uh, Scientific Center in Vienna. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you, both our speakers and our viewers, um, to a trilogue webinar on cancel culture um, in academia and beyond. Uh, the trilogue project is a platform for exchange uh, of ideas between scholars from Austria, Italy and Poland on issues of academic and uh, social political significance. And today uh, we meet to discuss um, a notion, a phenomenon that has become some sort of a slogan in recent years, I would say, so cancel culture. And according to one of the definitions of this phenomenon that one can find, uh, cancel culture is a mass and public uh, practice of uh, withdrawing one's support as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. And uh, the first use of such term uh, was noted, at least according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2016. And uh, since then, um, the term has been also increasingly employed to discuss uh, various um, various dimensions of the discussion about academic uh, and research freedom. Um, and today we, we would like to uh, indeed discuss those various aspects of, um, of the phenomenon of cancel culture uh, with our guests, uh, Marta Yuza, Daniela Neubacher and Tommaso Tupini, who really bring to the table um, a varied expertise uh, on the topic. Um, so trying to uh, to take advantage of this expertise to the fullest. Uh, we will start the first part of the webinar with presentations that will introduce uh, general issues um, re regarding cancel culture in the context of specific discussion in respective national contexts. And in the second part, uh, we will open the, the floor for questions, uh, also questions uh, from the audience um, to, to exchange various, uh, various views um, and various opinions um, on the topic. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Marta Yuza. Uh, Marta Yuza is an associate professor of sociology at the pedagogical, pedagogical sorry, University of Krakow. Um, she has authored monographs about history and contemporary features of the sociology of the internet, as well as many research articles on sociological analysis of media, new communication technologies and popular culture. Um, and our Polish viewers might uh, also know Marta from um, popular media uh, because uh, she presented her research uh, in Radio Talk FM or uh, the television TVN. Um, and it is really my pleasure to have you here today, Marta, and the floor is yours. Uh, so, uh, the title of uh, our webinar uh, is uh, Cancer Culture uh, in Academia and Beyond. Uh, so, first I'd, I'd like to uh, tell about uh, cancer culture uh, in uh, academia in Poland. And it uh, is uh, very brief and simple because the topic of uh, cancer culture among uh, Polish uh, scientists uh, or scholars uh, does not exist, uh, really. Uh, I, I don't know any research about it, uh, neither scientific uh, nor uh, conducted but, uh, by uh, social uh, research uh, institution, uh, centers for uh, social research and uh, so on. Uh, for now, I may say uh, that, uh, however, this topic, uh, topic uh, called uh, council culture uh, doesn't exist, uh, the phenomenon of uh, excluding some people from uh, academia exists. Uh, at least uh, attempts, attempts of uh, excluding, and uh, I'll come back uh, to this issue uh, later. Uh, however, uh, uh, however uh, the topic uh, among scientists doesn't exist, uh, this topic uh, is quite widely discussed uh, in the media uh, by uh, journalists, uh, rather, not by uh, scholars. Uh, but it is interesting uh, that journalist, uh, journalists uh, discuss this problem uh, not uh, in the Polish uh, context. Uh, and uh, there are uh, three uh, main uh, approaches uh, uh, of uh, journalists to a uh, problem of uh, cancel, cancel culture. Uh, and as far as I know, uh, most often uh, journalists, uh, uh, journalists are threatened. Uh, 
uh, try to scare uh, the public uh, and uh, warn uh, against uh, cancel culture. Uh, because they uh, find it as a threat to freedom of uh, speech. Uh, they uh, often uh, say that uh, cancel culture is uh, in the West already uh, and uh, in, it will be uh, in Poland uh, soon uh, unless uh, we resist it and we should uh, resist it. Uh, uh, the expression political correctness uh, shows up uh, uh, often uh, in their uh, statements uh, and uh, you have to know that uh, in Polish uh, public discourse uh, uh, political correctness uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, considered uh, as something uh, wrong. Uh, uh, and uh, political correctness, uh, uh, similarly uh, like uh, cancel culture, uh, is uh, often presented uh, like uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a danger, a uh, threat uh, to uh, freedom of uh, speech. Um, because uh, these uh, journalists uh, uh, would like uh, to say, uh, for example, that uh, homosexualism uh, is a disease and it uh, should be uh, cured, uh, and political correctness uh, forbids uh, to, uh, to say uh, something like that. Um, uh, in the uh, opposite side, uh, more, more leftist uh, side, uh, journalists uh, say that uh, cancel culture is uh, okay, uh, not only uh, because uh, it uh, stops uh, some people from, uh, hard, uh, from harding uh, others, uh, but mainly because uh, uh, in a pluralist uh, society everyone uh, can cancel, uh, everyone uh, can be cancelled, and uh, it is okay. Uh, it is uh, our uh, right. Uh, we don't have to uh, like uh, everybody, and uh, we uh, um, Sometimes uh, we don't want uh, uh, some people uh, in our social network and uh, it is uh, okay. Uh, uh, in pluralistic uh, society, uh, uh, there is uh, not uh, the only one uh, institution, uh, but uh, there are many uh, institutions, uh, organizations, social circles, um, and uh, uh, there are plenty of them. Uh, when, uh, so, uh, when someone uh, is cancelled uh, in one of them, uh, he or she uh, may uh, uh, go uh, to another one, and uh, it is uh, okay. Cancel culture uh, would be uh, a problem uh, in a, a society uh, in which uh, uh, the, the, there's no uh, many uh, uh, many uh, institutions, social circles, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, journalists uh, sometimes uh, say that uh, cancel culture is uh, nothing new, uh, and uh, it is not uh, harmful uh, actually, uh, because. Uh, uh, it, it have been it has been always uh, exist uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, excluding uh, some uh, people but uh, but uh, it, uh, uh, it it wasn't uh, called uh, cancel uh, culture uh, and uh, uh, third uh, third uh, approach uh, of uh, journalists uh, is uh, like cancel culture is a kind of uh, absurd uh, because uh, uh, canceling uh, someone uh, uh, doesn't mean uh, that uh, he or she uh, uh, will uh, disappear. Uh, 
so uh, we can uh, cancel uh, people, but it uh, doesn't make uh, any uh, sense. Uh, I'm sorry, because uh, without presentation, it is a little bit difficult to me, so uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I am uh, pretty sure uh, that uh, although uh, journalists uh, write uh, and uh, talk about uh, cancel culture, uh, the majority of uh, common people, uh, regular uh, citizens, uh, do not know uh, about uh, cancel culture, uh, haven't heard uh, this term, um, and uh, um, why why I uh, think uh, um, like that? Uh, because uh, there is no any uh, research uh, about it, and um, uh, usually uh, if uh, a phenomenon is uh, uh, is uh, a social problem, uh, it is uh, uh, th th there are uh, some uh, research uh, about it. Uh, uh, and uh, um, this is, this is uh, a cause uh, that uh, I think uh, um, that uh, majority of uh, Polish society uh, uh, didn't uh, hear nothing uh, about uh, cancel culture. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, good reasons uh, for cancel culture to exist uh, in uh, social consciousness, uh, but uh, it, uh, it is uh, not. Uh, roots of uh, cancel culture uh, 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 show uh, that uh, cancer culture is a weapon of uh, weak. And uh, in Polish society, uh, there are uh, huge social inequalities. Uh, so, cancer culture uh, should uh, exist uh, in our society, but uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, so, uh, here comes uh, the question why. Uh, and I suppose uh, there are uh, three uh, reasons. Uh, Polish uh, society is uh, very conservative, uh, and uh, cancel culture is a leftist concept. Uh, and uh, left, uh, uh, left, uh, left parties and uh, so on uh, never uh, have been uh, uh, popular in uh, Poland. Uh, uh, and uh, the most important is uh, uh, common people in uh, Poland uh, uh, have uh, uh, their own uh, good reasons uh, and good uh, ways uh, to exclude uh, some uh, other people, uh, but uh, they are not alike in uh, this uh, classical concept of uh, cancel culture. Uh, um, Polish people uh, cancel uh, the others uh, for uh, being different not uh, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, not being uh, uh, progressive enough, but uh, on the contrary, for being uh, different, uh, for, uh, um, for, uh, for example, uh, not going to church uh, every uh, Sunday or living together uh, without uh, marriage. Uh, but uh, nobody calls it uh, council culture. And uh, on my uh, presentation, I uh, had uh, uh, some uh, some famous uh, cases of uh, council culture, but I uh, I uh, have haven't uh, them uh, in my notes, uh, so it would be difficult to uh, to to say that. So it it is uh, everything.
Okay, thank you, Marta, and thank you very much for uh, really accepting the challenge of uh, presenting without your presentation. Uh, I can imagine that it wasn't really uh, exactly that easy as you expected, uh, and I think you did great. Um, and I hope that some of the examples might come back uh, in the discussion in any case. Um, and I think it was already interesting to see the various dimensions uh, in which the concept uh, is being brought up. Um, in, in Poland uh, as well. So thank you, thank you once again, um, and we really appreciate the effort. Um, and now I would like to ask uh, Daniela uh, to, introduce, to introduce the, so to say, um, Austrian uh, side of the discussion. Um, Daniela is an associate researcher at the IDM, the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. Um, and she studied journalism and communications um, in Graz and also at the St. Petersburg uh, State University uh, to later obtain a master's degree in Central European Studies um, at the Andrashi University Budapest, where she also continues her PhD research at the Doctoral School for Historical Science. Um, so Daniela will also bring a lot of expertise, not only on Austria, but also um, in comparison to Hungary, which uh, I'm also very much looking forward. Um, Daniela's research interests on a daily basis encompass historical trajectories of civil society and cross-border protest movements with a special focus on, uh, on environment environmentalism in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, sorry, I think uh, this webinar uh, is proving a bit challenging for all of us. The adrenaline kicked in, uh, but now I am very happy to open the floor uh, to you, Daniela. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Olga, very much for this introduction. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I would like to first uh, express uh, the fact that I'm talking not as an expert here on cancel culture, because I'm also not conducting research, at least not yet, because this topic seems really interesting. Um, and uh, I'm rather uh, speaking from the perspective of um, a student, uh, somebody who works with a lot of academics, uh, so in a professional way. Uh, I worked in, in, in communications in a university, um, so I see a bit it from the from the uh, perspective, maybe from the structural perspective, um, and yeah. So it's a very subjective position that I share here, and but I'm very happy to discuss it with you further. So I looked a bit at the Austrian um, debates uh, on on this term uh, cancel culture because uh, it seems that everybody perceives it a bit differently and. Um, as, as usual with this with this concept of terms, there are a lot of definitions and perceptions on it. But if I look at the um, discourse uh, in, in the last, let's say, one, two years, because it was pretty a young discourse, um, we had um, these debates on, on the level of culture, for example. Um, maybe you know this case, there was an Austrian comedian called uh, Lisa e uh, Eckhart, um, who in the end uh, cancelled her own participation in a literary festival in Germany um, because there was a, a public outcry uh, on her uh, on parts of her program. She she used to be very um, uh, provocative, um, also uh, regarding uh, cliches, uh, anti-Semitic um, cliches uh, that are that are in society and um, mostly. Um, uh, uh, activists from, from left-wing uh, um, groups were, were um, uh, protesting against her, uh, her satire and her uh, program. And um, yeah, this in all uh, ended, as I said, in a, in a cancellation by the artist herself. Uh, but it was not finished by that. Then a debate uh, started more or less on the freedom of arts, on limitations uh, of freedom of speech, freedom of arts and uh, satire. And um, of course, also on, in, in terms of Austria, on, on anti-Semitic uh, anti um, um, prejudice and, 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 and latent uh, issues going on in Austria itself. Um, some critics call it a witch hunt. Um, others said that censorship, the local parties, uh, um, especially the right-wing um, nationalist uh, alternative for Germany, uh, AfD, was uh, saying that this is a threat of Germany's freedom of speech. Um, in Austria, rather, it was um, perceived uh, of course, you had this, this polarized uh, perception of was it a cancellation, was it a threat of freedom of speech, 
um, or is it the right of an organizer to also withdraw an invitation? Um, but what I found personally very interesting that by this debate, um, questions of the role of female comedians uh, or also female uh, or uh, women in general in, in, in public, in art and in, in uh, comedy were raised and it kind of exposed or shed a light on some certain sensitivities to women um, spreading maybe uh, anti-Semitic cliches and, and supporting them even or um, that was very, very interesting because it kind of um, show, showed the question why do we even react so emotional and so sensitive to this, this very case. Um, and, and maybe we can discuss this further on uh, what does it say about a society if this kind of uh, case gets debated like that. So another level or an area where cancel culture was a topic was, of course, as in many countries, public space um, about uh, statues that are uh, should be removed or uh, streets that should be renamed. So this is a is not something new. This is I mean we now call might call it cancel culture, but this is something that has uh, been there for for many many years and decades and centuries. Uh, and one case was uh, the um, very famous um, street in Vienna, the uh, Karl Luegering that was uh, named after the former mayor. Uh, he was an anti-Semite and, uh, um, and, and activists and also historians um, demanded the uh, renaming of the street, which uh, was already taking place in 2012. Um, but there has been still a, a square and a statute uh, in the city center of Vienna also um, um, yeah, dealing with, with his uh, um, a bit, uh, yeah, heroization, let's say, and it, uh, there was a, a big um, debate on if you should uh, completely remove the statute, if you uh, should uh, get it and bring it into a context, put the sign there, is this enough just to put the sign for an information? Um, but in this case, uh, it's not, for me, in my perception, it was not as polarized, because even within historians, within um, experts, there were many different um, opinions on how to uh, treat these issues and how to um, cope with it. So um, I think there, um, yeah, it's a contested issue, but it's not, not so polarized yet as in, we see in many other uh, cities and countries in, in Central Europe. Uh, and last but not least, uh, the university, we also had the de cancel culture debate, but I think it was, uh, it's not as, uh, widely debated as maybe in Germany yet. Uh, there was one issue where students blocked the lecture of a historian that is uh, known to be close to the right-wing party. Um, and there was also a debate afterwards on the moralization of academia, on stigmatization of, of single academics and on academic freedom in general. But it was still, as I said, a very um, narrow debate maybe. This. So, if I still have a very short moment to, to sum up, let's say, I don't think uh, there is some uh, national particularities regarding cancel culture in, in the case of Austria. Um, of course, history plays an important role. Uh, the 20th century is kind of reference to, to many, many issues, but also the, all the cases that have come up in the last years were often shedding lights on, on um, hot issues, societal issues that have not been revolve, uh, resolved, um, for example, xenophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, uh, feminism, and, and many, many other issues, racism, of course. So it's really an important issue to talk about. So thank you for this. Thank you, Daniela, for this uh, very interesting uh, overview. Uh, and I think you also touched upon some um, new dimensions of the discussion, uh, for example, the gender dimension of the discussion or the moralization of academia and how we perceive uh, uh, also academics as academics and academics as individuals, perhaps, uh, and uh, what is the relationship between these two dimensions. Uh, and I really hope that we will indeed uh, come back to um, this uh, threats uh, in the discussion.
And against this background, last and not uh, but not least, uh, I would like to invite uh, Tommaso um, to uh, to um, present uh, um, on the Italian side of the discussion. Uh, Tommaso Tupini uh, is a professor of theoretical philosophy at the University of Verona, and uh, he's the author of multiple monographs um, as well as many other research and magazine articles. And I also know uh, that he organized a conference about uh, cancel culture. So very curious to hear all the insights from this session. Thank you, Master Authority. Yeah, thank you for the invitation of the organization. I'm, I'm, I fear that you cannot listen. Can you hear me? Because uh, I, I guess my connection is pretty bad. You can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's good, because I don't hear you very well, but if you can hear me, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation, for the organization. But I don't have much to add to what we had heard already, because in Italy is the same thing. Italy has been immune so far to cancel culture uh, debate. Nobody in Italy so far that some graduation programs are based uh, solely on white European music from a slavery time. Such news uh, came from the Oxford, or that Homer's Odyssey has to be removed uh, from curricula because it's not uh, inclusive. We haven't, we didn't have these things in Italy, like in uh, in Poland and in Austria, probably. So you know, because we are Catholic countries, that's what I would like to talk about tonight. Because we are Catholic country, that's why cancel culture is not that popular. Such issues don't receive much attention in Italy, and they keep coming mainly from the US and from the UK. That's my opinion why, because cancel culture, as generic this expression might be, is in a very specific faith. There is a very specific faith at the root of cancel culture. And this, this is the faith that words, programs, declarations, projects, will redeem Western humanity from the awful deeds of the past. We did something awful in the past, we make a promise, we will make it good for this. So uh, good intentions must, must make up uh, for this, uh, text and works of art and whatever kind of document from the past which bears memory of our splitting blood, the splitting blood of other people. And cancel culture is a promise, is based on words, on this promise. We won't hurt you anymore. People of the rest of the world, be safe. Uh, we won't hurt you anymore. We will not hurt you anymore. Not even with the memory of the past. Because the memory of the past might be very hurting. So we won't hurt you anymore. Not with us not with the memory of the past. That's the promise. Who makes the promise? Who is the cancel culture guy? Who makes the promise? A man of faith. People having faith. Catholics, we don't have faith. Like uh, Pasolini said, you cannot be a good Catholic and a good Christian. They are two different things. We don't have faith. Uh, Protestants, Puritans, they do have faith. And they make promise. And that's the promise that the future will be essentially different from the past and that in the future we will not harm people like you we used to be in the past. That's the promise. And Catholics, they don't believe in promises. That's why Italians are not very reliable. I don't know if you had to do already with Italian people, but we know they might be charming, they might be funny, they might have some charm, but they're not reliable people because they cannot make promise. They believe in the future is not, it's, uh, the promise is a business of trust. I cannot trust Catholic people. That's why cancel culture is not very popular here, because Catholic culture is based on things and action. What is a cathedral, a cathedral, a statue? The fact of being together here and now, the, the four of us and the people who have the patience to listen to what we're talking about, 
to live in this present based on the past, on its ambiguity, on the ambiguity on the past, the ambiguity on the past. This past that satisfies on itself and thus produces the present. In this perspective, the future is a kaleidoscopic combination of already existing things. That's how we Catholic, I'm not talking, it's not a thing of faith. I'm not talking about religious faith. I'm talking about education. That's what Catholic educated people can believe in. A future as a recombination of already existing elements of the past. Future can be created, but cannot be said, cannot be programmed, cannot be promised as the Puritan things. If you're a man of faith, a Puritan, uh, then you live the future like this. You live the future as a radical break, like a radical detachment of the future from what became before the future. A society, a society, a gathering no more corrupted by uh, vice, exploitation, inequality, sex, perversion, depravity, gambling, whatever. Whatever makes life worth to be lived. Like you might remember of it, this was an American journalist, Alexander Wal Woolcott. Some people say it was Oscar Wilde, but actually it was not him, it was Woolcott said anything good in life, anything good in life is either illegal or immoral or fattening. Anything good in life. And everybody understands this, except for the Puritan. The man obsessed by this community of the future where ancient corruption in all its forms has been erased. Cancel culture is the academic version of this uh, parting from the past. The past, which is an amazing thing, these broken things partly failed, not up to date, very unsuccessful, sometimes imperfect. And we can react to this past with wonder and admiration and commotion and enthusiasm. Or we can react like the Puritan, the cancel culture guy, scandalized, and start wishing about the future where you rectify what is wrong, you make straight what is bent, you make smooth what is rough. No more hurt of darkness, no more slippery ways, no spectacular fails and spectacular falls, but sheer virtuosity, virtuosity and equality supported by a huge sense of guilt, because that's the double bind of the cancer culture. The drive to the future fueled by a huge sense of guilt, a huge sense of guilt, like a depressive passion, what Spinoza called sad passion, fueling your drive to the future. That's the most perverse thing you can do in your life. I think I said enough. I w just want to end up with, with a quote uh, from the greatest writer of the 20th century, Thomas Mann, who already in 1917 knew this was about to come. In 1917, 100 years ago, he knew this was about to come and warned us about the man of virtue, the man of virtue, the cancel culture guy, he called the enemy of the adventure and anything good in life. Thomas Mann is, 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 says, says all the time, do not resist evil. Do not resist evil like the gospel. Do not resist evil. Because what is evil? What can the cultural people would like to erase from earth? This is evil. To pull to the forbidden, the drive to adventure, to lose oneself, to abandon oneself, to experience, to explore, to understand. It is the seductive and tempting element. The man of virtue cannot understand what Thomas Mann calls the dangerous, harmful element. And Thomas Mann imagined that in the future something will be forbidden. Something will be forbidden. And what will be forbidden? Thomas Mann makes a very amazing musical example. Will be forbidden Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, the Pathetic, especially the third movement, a sort of march that Thomas Mann defines like this, and with this I'm at the end. The third movement of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, like the root of all evils, of all bliss, of dangerous work in its sweet, which one neither hears nor understands without experiencing the antithesis, the antithesis 
of art and spirit of virtue. Between West, Western canon, Western civilization, and the spirit of virtue, they are completely going different ways. I'm thinking of the third movement with its uh, malicious march music, which, if we had a censor in the service of democratic enlightenment, if we had a censor in the service of democratic enlightenment, which we have right now, and many of them, would absolutely have to be forbidden. This guy is not at all a gypsy and an adventurer, but much more the opposite of this, the cancer culture guy, a pedant, a man of principle, a solid man. What is more disgusting than a solid man? A solid man, a virtuous man, and a man of secure soul who said adieu, goodbye to every intellectual vagabondage who looks neither to the right nor to the left, but keeps his eye on the path the narrow path of virtue and of progress that one can tread only by means of the doctrine, which I give away very, very pleasantly for a glass of wine. So that's not my thing. And that's, I think, what with Catholic cultural people, we can find a common understanding thing about this. Thank you. Thank you, Tommaso. This was, uh, wow, that was like a very, like a full package of uh, many different perspectives. Um, and uh, my, my takeaway will definitely be thinking about a cancel culture con conceptualized as parting from the past. Thank you for this expression. This is a very interesting point um, to think about. Um, and with that, uh, I, I think I would actually like to open the discussion. Um, so having heard this very different presentations, um, I would like to stay first on a relatively general level. Um, because we touched upon many different uh, aspects of the phenomenon. So uh, we talked about political correctness, we talked about uh, research freedom, we talked about uh, renaming streets uh, and cancelling historical figures. Um, and I wanted to push a little bit more on that, um, asking what is cancel culture really about and how it relates to those other um, notions and terms that we have, like political correctness or free speech? Um, and is it a good or bad phenomenon, the way we conceptualize it? Um, and uh, I, I would like you to maybe um, start with the discussion, Marta, if that's OK. Um, you might, of course, draw on your own opinion, uh, but also feel free to, to link it back to various points of the discussion um, that we already touched upon. Uh, okay, uh, what is uh, cancel culture uh, in my opinion? I think uh, it is easier to me uh, uh, to say uh, what uh, cancel culture uh, is not. Uh, definitely, uh, cancel culture uh, is uh, not a danger, it is not uh, a threat. Uh, at least uh, in a pluralistic uh, society. As long as we live uh, in a democratic pluralistic uh, society, uh, council culture uh, is not uh, is not uh, something uh, wrong. It is not uh, something dangerous. Um, uh, because uh, there are uh, some uh, other social circles, uh, uh, professional uh, societies, uh, universities, uh, media, uh, scientific, uh, uh, academic uh, association. And uh, if uh, someone is uh, counseled in uh, one of them, uh, he or she uh, can go uh, to uh, another, and it is uh, very uh, simple. Uh, for me, cancel culture is uh, a kind of uh, uh, a kind of uh, curiosity, uh, a kind of uh, intellectual uh, thought. It is something uh, in fashion. Uh, it is something uh, in vogue, uh, and uh, I think uh, it uh, won't survive uh, because uh, soon uh, it uh, will become uh, boring uh, to uh, intellectual uh, elites, uh, cultural uh, elites, academic uh, elites, symbolic elites, and uh, so on. Uh, and uh, I think uh, council culture is uh, closed uh, in. Uh, 
uh, in the circle of uh, these uh, elites. Uh, council culture uh, is uh, not something uh, very popular, uh, at least in Poland. I don't know, maybe uh, in your uh, countries uh, it is. Uh, but uh, in, uh, in uh, Polish society, it is uh, something uh, good for uh, young urban uh, hipsters, uh, but not for uh, regular uh, citizens. Uh, and uh, I think they, uh, be uh, they will become uh, bored uh, so someday uh, with, uh, with this, uh, this, uh, this kind of fashion. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, so I think uh, it is, uh, and uh, I think uh, cancel culture. Uh, this uh, all discussion about cancel culture is um, much noise about uh, nothing uh, because uh, cancel culture, not not cancel culture, but uh, phenomenon of uh, excluding uh, some people. Uh, have been uh, existed always and it exists now and uh, will exist uh, uh, later. Uh, so uh, it is not uh, something problematic, uh, I, I think. Um, and it is not uh, something dangerous. And Mm, so this is this is my opinion. What what is culture? What uh, is the cancel culture, and uh, what what it is not? Thank you very much. Um, this is definitely an interesting perspective to think about it um, as a term that uh, describes a phenomenon that has been there always uh, and perhaps uh, will pass by soon. Um, and now I would like to give the uh, floor to Daniela uh, to um, to try to um, yes build build upon this point and uh, and maybe add a little bit more on her own perspective about what culture cancel culture is and what uh, what it is not. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm a bit a bit overwhelmed because there were many f aspects and and I. I didn't agree with with every observation, but on the other hand, as I know that there are so many perceptions on what up on the definition is uh, I, I I can understand it. Um, mm, I was a bit writing down some stuff because I I thought about uh, uh, what what um, what you asked like is it good or bad and I think I don't want to answer that at all and I think that's not the question either. But of course you can always raise this question. But then we it leads to this this uh, what what maybe Tommaso said about this virtue you know if you immediately try to to categorize it in good and bad then then you're already doing it wrong maybe before we even understand what it what it might do what's the the function of it or or what's the the origins of it um, so for me I, I really much uh, like this idea of of um, what do we do with it? Why do we do it? Why do we cancel? Or why do we have this this uh, effort of of um, of creating uh, a discourse and shaping the discourse according to what we find is right and wrong? And for me, it was a bit like um, we we for example in terms of public in the case of public space that we want to try with this cancellation or this replacement we want to to kind of delete things that are uncomfortable. Also, Tommaso was already saying this mostly it's about the past. It's about something that is that is there, that is uh, present, that's maybe too much present. Uh, there is um, there are things or people, groups of people under underrepresented. And now we try to to recreate this public space together. Uh, and 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 we see it as a canvas, you know. We we just uh, want to paint over it, want to to draw new things on it, and 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 want to to draw the world as we want to have it in our idealist way, you know, uh, knowing that that the reality is so completely different. And that's why we, we try to first erect a, a statue and and think then with this seeing it so visible, then we can also act accordingly. But uh, yeah, I think we, we are all, all agree that this is not the way how, how things work. 
uh, it's it's symbolism maybe it's uh, but it it will not bring the change that we might want to to have maybe in society so public space is not primarily to stare to seek justice or to to seek representation or or to kind of make make ideals real you know it's it's rather about uh I don't know. We need to seek justice, or we need we to bring change in 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 our daily lives, in our in our structures, in our systems, uh, and we need to to do it not by replacing things, replacing statues or so, uh, but rather by by finding compromise, by debating and so on, which is not a quick fix. And I think this cancel culture debate is a bit like we think that there are quick fixes, like canceling a person that is uh, uncomfortable or saying something that we don't agree um but but it's so much harder than that um to to fix things if we want to fix things i mean <laughs> that's that was also a question today <laughs> yes yeah, that, that's a very good one and of course the question whether it is good or bad is somehow a provocative one uh, exactly to start the discussion uh, about many different dimensions of what we want to achieve um and what we can achieve with what we have um, and with that thought, I would also like to uh, give the floor to Tommaso uh, to, to build on what we uh, have just heard. No, I think Daniela said the radical, the most radical thing, if you want to fix things, if you really feel like you should fix in things, then you're, then, but maybe things, things are not uh, made to be fixed, maybe it's good like this. We were not forced to fix things. But that she said another thing which is important. I guess I can uh, resume what she was saying also in another way. So this cancel culture, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche used to say the Germans are not, uh, the, they cannot digest what they eat. They suffer of dyspepsia, a huge dyspepsia. Dyspepsia is when you cannot digest what you eat. In cancel culture, you have a huge phenomenon of dyspepsia. You cannot digest your own past. When you when you have this when you embarrassed, when you get into you bump into something which you don't perceive it very well, so you don't know exactly what use you can do of it. So it stays on your stomach. Then you suffer from this. There are some things in the world that act like this. We cannot perceive them, we cannot use them. The world is embarrassing us, is surprising us. But that's very paradoxical when it happens with our past. We are not even able to digest our past. This ambiguity of beauty and violence of which Western culture is made, we suffer of dyspepsia and then we become cancel culture people. We cannot digest it anymore. Cancel culture, uh, you said already before, is ancient as Western civilization. Christian iconoclasm uh, was a form of cancel culture, destroying the pagan idols. This was one of the first forms of cancel culture. We have remem we remember, we are documented about it. Destroying the pagan idols. And what was the purpose of this destroying the pagan idols? Just one purpose. Make the world less happy than it used to be. But that was the meaning of destroying pagan idols to negate the presence of the body of God in reality. It was like such a passione triste, like a very, very sad passion. And that's what is always cancel culture is made of, sad passion. Of course, things and thought they get destroyed all the time. It's not true that everything returns. Some forms of life and some forms of thought they are a failure and they don't come back. And also understand the thing about destroying monuments from time to time in the early 90s in Russia, it was understandable that people tear down Lenin statue. Of course, this is very understandable, but when you tear down something, that's my question. You say the Western cultural canon drips blood and is consistent with war, conquest and civilization. Okay, you destroy our monuments, but where are your monuments? Where is your poetry? What is your tragedy? Grimm's Märchen, they are too violent and discriminating. Give me your politically correct Grimm's brother and I will be happy. But I don't think you will be able to give me back the Grimm's Märchen without the violence and without the more 
this uh, that's suspicious about culture culture movement that's it thank you very much um so I, I, I'm just thinking that now we can maybe try to move this uh, general debate uh, towards more academic context. Uh, we, we also talked a lot about the past and uh, how cancel culture tries to deal with the past. But of course, as we also see from the discussion, it is about the past, but it is also about the future um, of this aspiration of achieving um, a better world in a way, uh, however we define it. Um, and in that context, I would also um, like to ask um, exactly about the academic discussion um, taking place uh, in relation to cancel culture or um, freedom, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of uh, research. Um, so uh, in many countries right now, um, for example, the gender um, courses on, or gender studies experience difficulties uh, from governments, for example, in Hungary, also in Romania, um, in Poland, the situation is also escalating. Uh, the Polish Minister of Science and Education uh, has in recent months on multiple occasions said that uh, freedom of research in Poland does not exist and needs to be re-established, uh, in particular in the context of uh, conservative uh, thinkers being discriminated against. Um, and here my question would be, uh, also in the context of what we uh, have said previously, um, if we're thinking about the future, um, is it really for the culture to figure all those challenges out, uh, also for the academic culture, uh, or is it for the governments, for example? Um, so what is really, what we can do about it, uh, and whose uh, job is it to try to draw these lines? Uh, I, I think Tommaso said that it's very difficult to, to do that, and uh, no one can really give us the politically correct version of uh, uh, Grimm's version, uh, but uh, somehow we need to establish this compromise uh, uh, that Daniela also mentioned to, to find uh, the solution that tries to bridge different visions of what we try to achieve. Um, and uh, yeah, my question would be, whose job is it also in the academic context? Is it for academia itself uh, or is it for the governments? Um, and what is perhaps our role um, as academics? Um, and I would also like to start uh, with Marta, if that's okay. Um, if you uh, have any observations on this point, uh, I would be very uh, curious to hear them. Uh, not by uh, authorities, definitely, <laughs> at least at Poland, uh, because uh, it, it would be uh, it would be worse than a resolution. Uh, in huh, in Poland. Uh, Cancel culture uh, is not a problem, uh, really, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, canceling uh, some people, uh, academic uh, too, uh, by uh, our present uh, right-wing uh, authorities uh, and uh, by our conservative society is a problem. Uh, this is uh, a problem, not uh, not a concept of uh, cancel culture. And uh, uh, they cancel uh, some people, but uh, not uh, for failing, uh, for being uh, uh, pro progressive enough, uh, but uh, on the contrary, they cancel uh, for being uh, different. Uh, considering uh, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, religion, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, and so on, so on. And uh, uh, as you mentioned uh, about our minister, uh, this guy is uh, transported uh, from uh, middle age, <laughs> I, I guess, uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, uh, if... Uh, a person like uh, him uh, uh, could uh, decide uh, what uh, uh, what uh, topics uh, of uh, research uh, uh, can we uh, choose. Uh, it uh, would be disaster. Uh, so, so I, I think uh, in general uh, uh, science uh, should be free and uh, scientists, scholars uh, uh, should be allowed to 
uh, take any uh, topics, uh, any topic uh, uh, should uh, uh, should uh, 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 should do uh, research uh, on uh, each topic uh, and. Uh, um, no topic uh, would uh, should be um, uh, moral uh, incorrect uh, or uh, moral inappropriate. Uh, it uh, uh, it uh, should depend on uh, scientists only. Thank you. So, so you would say that uh, this is for the research community to deal with. Uh, views or points of view that um, that um, are maybe scientifically incorrect, uh, if I understood um, you well. Um, and with that, I would like to give uh, give the floor to Daniela. Uh, maybe maybe you can share uh, some of the discussion taking place in Austria as well. Um, I know that the, your ministry um, also organized uh, was supposed to organize a debate on cancel culture at the universities, uh, which unfortunately did not happen. Uh, but this suggests that, that the topic is perhaps present um, in this academic context. Uh, so uh, so I would be very curious to hear. Um, what is happening in Austria as well, and what you personally think uh, think about it? Um, yeah, I was I was also very surprised that this didn't take place, and I was kind of amused that we are talking about uh, academic freedom in Austria uh, in in this context or in this constellation, uh, while I a bit missing this kind of debate in in uh, in the local uh, context. But um, I find it great, and I find it. Um, Perfect, because I think we need to kind of get rid of these national glasses uh, when we talk about this phenomenon. Uh, I think uh, it, it's wrong to say, uh, honestly, that there is no cancel culture in this uh, that uh, country because it's everywhere. It's just not called like this. Yeah, uh, but uh, that's just something wherever there is communication, wherever there is uh, media and a public sphere. I don't know, there is also things that are selected to be in public sphere. Uh, there are things that are ostracized. And so um, maybe what's a bit new is that uh, people and, and a lot of people who haven't had access or power to um, to have their say in what is uh, what is said in public sphere uh, can can express their their opinion in, in, in social media, for example. So. Uh, as we as we see it with shitstorms, for example, I mean this is something more or less new um, that I can sit at home and can can express myself that I'm I'm, ha I'm happy that somewhere uh, in a city far away uh, this and this is on the on the program or this person has has a right to say something. So uh, I think this this dynamic is a bit different now than before. We we know cancelling from from the state from the side of the states with, with censorship. We know uh, structural cancellation, um, but now we have, you know, every day uh, or every every citizen can more or less uh, contribute to this, which is also, I think, a, a good sign maybe um, that that you can express your your disagreement, of course, with that. But when we now talk about academic freedom, I mean, I'm not in an Austrian university, so I see it from a very different perspective. Um, I see the the um, developments in Hungary much much closer, maybe, uh, and there um, the cancel culture itself is not the the main issue. There, uh, academic freedom is is threatened on a much much more different level, which is the structural level, and um, I really miss a kind of a comparative uh, per perspective on this the structural. Uh, uh, problems that the higher education sectors in, in Europe have and, and also in, in Central Europe, of course, because they have indirectly very, very much uh, influence on, on, uh, on curriculum, on the discourses at universities and on the communications to, to the public. Um, we see in Hungary maybe a, a really a, a worst case scenario at the moment with, with really a lot of self censorship. Uh, among academics, uh, at least, let's say, in my personal bubble of, of younger researchers uh, really thinking, uh, reconsidering how to uh, choose topics, how to, to choose their words, 
um, because there is a government agenda uh, that is very, very clear. There is a perception or the, the expectation of the government that is embodied in the law uh, that the role of academics, in the, what, what is the role of academics and what of the, is the role of universities. And that's not something very specific Hungarian, that's a tendency in, in many, many countries, I think, that uh, governments try to solve their problems much, uh, much more with, with or by, by means of the university and by means of research and, and uh, really influencing that as directly as possible. Um, mostly un, in, under, under the, um, let's say, under the argument, which is not real, that, that it's a, a market orientation of university or so. Um, um, so I, I hope you can follow what I mean, but it's, uh, I think it's the biggest threat at the moment in, in, in terms of academic freedom. Uh, but there is no, no broader debate or transnational debate of what do we actually understand as academic freedom. There are no rankings that really include academic freedom as, as a factor of, of higher education. I mean, there are many, many issues at the moment. And last but not least, the, the individual academic most, mostly doesn't have the time maybe and the, the resources to even talk about that. And that's, I think, one of the most urgent issues, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, it is very interesting to hear, of course, about the structural um, side of debate. I, I think we've, uh, we've all heard about the developments and uh, they are, of course, very concerning. Uh, I can only add that in Poland there have been some uh, proposals to perhaps not yet engage so deeply with substantive dimensions of the academic freedom, but to shift, for example, the university's power in disciplinary measures, which of course also relate to the structural issues of broader um, academic freedom. Uh, so this is definitely something worth uh, perhaps uh, going back to if we can uh, have another webinar at some point. Uh, but uh, I would also be very interesting to see a global ranking of academic freedom. Um, maybe this would also be um, a wonderful uh, research project for the future. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to give uh, yeah, give the floor to Tommaso. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would be very curious to hear um, what's the debate in Italy and uh, how academic freedom is uh, perceived in this context, perhaps in your country. No, it was very interesting to do a ranking among this all this stupid and dumb ranking we hear all the time, also ranking about academic freedom. My question is, is it rankable? Can you make a ranking of academic freedom? That's the difficult thing. That's why all rankings are like uh, very, very suspicious, the only ranking we hear about. But you were, this, you opened this debate, putting a question about being an academics. Of course, academics tend to overestimate uh, themselves. Like uh, Marta said before, I would say the same thing about Italy, uh, except for academics in the uh, middle 30s, middle 40s, nobody knows in Italy about cancel culture debate, right? You know, but cultivated people, cultivated people of a certain age never heard of this. That's the first premise. The second premise is, uh, from where we are, uh, from where we are taking the words, like from where we are talking uh, about this. Like I speak from Italy, then I say something, but I wouldn't say the same thing if I would be living in Russia or in the US. Of course, I would say very, very different thing. Like we try to relate this cancel culture phenomenon to our present situation where we are. In the in the US, yes, of course, this is. This became already a criterion of selections, not just for teachers, not just for professionals, for deans too. To be the dean of a certain American university, you need to belong to a certain minority. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it is a fact that we cannot lie about reality. It is like this. There are some very important American universities that right now they say you, you can apply to be a dean of the university, director, director, but you need to belong to a minority. If not, you cannot. Uh, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you do not belong to a minority, you cannot be a dean of our university. It doesn't happen in Europe, it doesn't happen in Italy, but it will happen, like everything. 
like weed in the US now is legal, it will become legal in, in Europe in 10 years. In 10 years, uh, up, this justice can apply for 100% sure that it will happen. Is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. Uh, for me, it's a little bit stupid because, like, someone, if he can write good, is an interesting person, I don't, I really don't give a damn if he, from a minority or not. So, for me, it's beyond comprehension. But it will, uh, it will come, it will arrive. It will arrive in a society that we think uh, is very liberal. We, we talk all the time about this hyper liberalism. And it's exactly the opposite, because they will still think about the crimes of opinion, especially in the, in especially the academies. The crimes of opinion, a liberal society cannot uh, live and uh, going on with the crimes of opinion. We still live in this atmosphere, the crimes of opinion. Uh, pass off, uh, watch your back. What are you talking about? What words are you using? There, is, there, is, there are still crimes of opinion. This is for me very scary, very, very scary. I'm scared about the fact that words can lead you to jail. And that's what we're living in. Words, talking, can bring you to jail. And for me, that's monstrous. Like, I cannot understand this, but that's where we're I, I think that uh, this opens yet another, a very broad debate, actually, um, about probably hate speech and hate crimes and many different uh, issues um, that uh, maybe we would uh, be able to um, to uh, bring up again uh, in the future um, in the one of our uh, next uh, webinars, uh, actually. Um, but thank you very much for this uh, contribution. Um, I think it, in a way, it also linked to Daniela's point about moralization of academia. Uh, when it comes to a broader discussion. Um, so maybe I would like to push as a last question, because we are already running out of time, I would like to push a little bit about um, responsibilities of individual academics. Um, if we are judged somehow differently um, than, let's say, private individuals, if, for example, should we um, should we uh, separate um, academic views from personal views and personal opinions presented in a public space? Uh, Daniela mentioned this case uh, of a professor who also belongs uh, or sympathizes with, uh, with a rather uh, right-wing party. And this was the reason for his cancellation at the university. So on an individual level, do you think that academics have some sort of a higher moral responsibility um, towards broader public um, than um, an average individual, if I can uh, put it this way. Maybe this time, if we could start with Tommaso, you also uh, touched, uh, touched upon it uh, a little bit, but if you could expand, uh, then I would really appreciate it. Right. So to get to our conclusions, in my opinion, it was the question you put me before, yes, like uh, uh, so-called cancel culture, it's in its smallness, it's like a rat. It is a threat to free speech and is uh, like nothing interesting. It is, it is the expression of a fear. Cancel culture people, they're scared about something. They're really scared. They, uh, no, they, when you say, I scare the shit out of you, when you say in the US, that happens to the cancel culture people. They're scared of themselves as posing a potential harm to everyone. Nietzsche, Nietzsche said very good words about this, but it happens to everybody in, us, in our common life. I'm pretty sure everybody of us remember these cases. When you were like, uh, maybe unpolite to someone, but you were not aware, uh, you didn't say hi, but you were not aware, you didn't want to do this deed, and you did, and you, you, were like, you felt like bad because you did this without wanting it, without wanting it. It happens all the time. We do harm to people without wanting it. Somebody calls us 10 times. We don't answer the phones. We hurt them. Is this a good reason to answer to them? Because that's the real pathology of the cancel culture guy. This fear of hurting people of the time. Of course you do, because life is made of this hurting. From, from time to time, it's made of, of this hurting. It's made of Mephisto. Mephisto. Ich bin ein Teil von jener Kraft, die stets das Böse will und stets das Gute schafft. That's Western culture. 
we achieved great, great, great results to our even we have to do it again, but we have to remember about this. It's not like, uh, it's not our, our life is going to be very, very unhappy. Just to, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a question, uh, it's an answer that might actually spark a lot of controversies if you think about it. Uh, because uh, I, I also think about cancel culture uh, without any definitive answers, of course, uh, as a tool for vulnerable groups to regain power or uh, some sort of public space that uh, they have not uh, had access to in the past. And uh, in that uh, sense, um, when I think about it, I'm not sure if I fully fully agree, uh, but uh, I, I'm very happy that we can exchange those, uh, those different, uh, different points of uh, view. And uh, with that, going back to the question about an individual academic, I would like to ask Daniela to maybe uh, share a little a bit more um, of her views on that point. Thank you. Yeah, I always like it when 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 there is Faust uh, mentioned in a in a panel discussion. <laughs> I don't know. Then then there must be a, a philosopher on the panel. That's great. <laughs> um, but I think it's not it's not that easy. I mean, maybe on a on a on a general level, yes, I would agree. But in a very very specific case, if you are in charge personally to to organize something, to, to cancel yes or no something, you know? And if you uh, also have to live with the consequences of this, of your actions, and so maybe career options or, or, or uh, just, just the, the perception of your peers or whatever, then this, 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 it's also a bit moral, you know, this moral standard of um, just accept the, the evil and just let it be and, and, and I, I don't know acknowledge it that it's there wouldn't help me to to make this decision um so i don't know i still need to define my role uh, as, a, as an academic or also as a professional in communication whatsoever and i think it's at the moment people or my perception academics are a bit left alone in this in this decision making it's uh, also maybe the responsibility of, of universities in this regard and here we are again at the structure because um, I would like, as if I'm an academic working for a university, so I would like to have the, the university here on my side, also providing maybe help in, in, in communicating, maybe help in, 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 in doing this decision making, in finding these compromises, getting into dialogue, you know, finding, finding formats where you can have this dialogue that is necessary. Um, I find there's a lot of pressure at the moment on, on single people who, who have the need to initiate debates, to have the need to or see the, the responsibility in going public and, and, and giving opinions um, besides the, 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 the community of peers and, I don't know, scientific communities. And these people, I find, uh, are, are very much left alone uh, in, uh, in academia at the moment. Uh, that also is rooted in, in the problem of, and this is of course also my, my experience in, in, in the, on the one hand you have the prof professionalization of communications of universities, but these communications are not uh, working in, in for science, for debates uh, as a priority, they're doing PR for the university in this whole competition. They're, they try to defend it uh, from, from external factors, from competition uh, for rankings, you know, and so on. But they're not really there for, for uh, yeah, for doing science communication in, in its original perception. And, and I think uh, initiating a debate and, and really uh, facing this, this bad things and facing the past. And so this requires a lot of uh, resources that are at the moment not present in, in universities. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very interesting point, um, exactly going back to the structural issues. Um, and I think at some point I read a contribution uh, saying that the best guarantee for academic freedom is actually better working condition for scholars. Um, and I'm just thinking that this maybe somehow relates to what you have just said, um, to, to prepare our um, academics, our individuals working at the universities better uh, to face uh, such debates. 
Um, and with that, I would like to, uh, last but not least, uh, give, uh, give the floor to Marta. Um, uh, please, uh, you have the closing word here. Okay, uh, but what was your question exactly? Uh, um, my question was about uh, our responsibilities as uh, individual academics. Uh, if uh, the standards to which we hold ourselves are somehow different than an average individual, uh, how can we um, face or how we can position ourselves within this cancel culture debate? Um, and uh, feel free to, to address it from your point of view. It's a very complex question itself. Okay, uh, so as I said, the science uh, should be free uh, and uh, uh, each science, uh, as I said, should be allowed uh, to do uh, research on uh, any topic, but uh, he or she should do it uh, uh, correctly, uh, theoretically, methodologically, uh, and so on, so on. Uh, but uh, uh, a scientist, uh, should um, mm, should uh, search the truth, uh, search the truth, uh, and uh, do uh, research uh, for uh, for finding uh, truth uh, about uh, world, and uh, we should be uh, responsible responsible uh, for our research, but. Uh, but uh, uh, very important is uh, our research uh, should be uh, correct, correctly uh, conducted, uh, theoretically, methodologically, and it, it is uh, it is most important thing. Uh, and uh, one, one one more thing: uh, uh, each scientist uh, should uh, uh, talk uh, about. Uh, uh, what is and not uh, what should be, uh, because uh, when a scientist uh, start start to uh, say what should be, uh, he or she ceases uh, to be a scientist. Uh, he uh, become he or she become a, a kind of preacher, uh, not not a scientist. Uh, and uh, this is uh, our individual uh, responsibility uh, to say uh, what it is uh, during uh, our lectures and, uh, and uh, so on. Thank you very much. I think normative uh, disciplines like law uh, might disagree on this point, uh, I, I think, but uh, uh, of, of course I agree with the point that we should uh, always make sure that our research is up to the standard, up to the state of debate and uh, uh, is conducted uh, methodologically and theoretically uh, in a sound way. Uh, and uh, I think this is uh, the, the major basic standard uh, of any um, good uh, research. Um, and I think from this discussion, uh, uh, I will let myself uh, sum up. Of course, uh, please feel free to intervene uh, if I misinterpreted anything that uh, was said uh, in your opinion. But I, I think uh, we can tell already that uh, there is like a complex uh, debate around the cancel culture and maybe cancel culture is actually misleading as a term um, and when we think about uh, academic environment um, there is a lot to be done in terms of structural um, issues um, of course in countries that face uh, structural systemic issues in the first place but also more broadly in terms of providing support uh, for individual researchers to to be able to uh, to position themselves and to face difficult debates in academia um, but in any case of course uh, we as individual researchers uh, should always make sure that um, we conduct our work um, to the highest standard possible. Um, and I think um, uh, we can all agree uh, that this is definitely um, our mission. And uh, with that, I would like to maybe uh, let you to add some final closing remarks. Uh, if any of you would like to leave our viewers with any specific thought, uh, I, I would really like to invite you now to take the floor. Why don't Maybe you Olga tell us something resume like resuming like what did you tell us uh, your perspective? Well, uh, I, I'm here. That's not my role exactly. Uh, my my role was kind of to facilitate the discussion. Uh, but uh, of course, I have uh, some sort of opinions on the topic. Uh, but I'm also very strongly uh, convinced. Uh, that uh, one should not really form a definitive opinion until one is informed well enough. Uh, and as Daniela also said in the beginning, uh, I, I think I'm here more as a 
curious listener um, than, than an expert, really. Um, but uh, I, I indeed think that um, there are good sides of the phenomenon uh, in terms of uh, giving perhaps um, power to some groups that have been excluded from this power for a long time. Uh, but at the same time, I still think there are certain dangers perhaps uh, in so far as we should always be aware um, not to exclude others um, with what we do. Uh, but I think those are very complex and very context dependent discussion. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I think Daniela also mentioned that uh, we have this ideal in mind of what we would like to achieve when we think about cancel culture, the related phenomena, but uh, perhaps, um, you know, it is not always that easy in real life uh, to, to make this ideal real, uh, because we also have to compromise on various points. Um, and I think in that, of course, it's always very context specific, um, also in academia. And I think it's very context specific, depending on the country, uh, but also perhaps on, uh, on a given academic issue, because we have also very different issues in this academic package to take into account. Um, so uh, I think that would be my point of view. It's definitely not conclusive, um, but, uh, but I hope it leaves enough of question open uh, to, to kind of keep the debate going um, and, uh, and maybe try to confront our ideas with different points of view. Um, and I definitely took a lot from this discussion for myself, uh, a lot of food of, uh, for thought to, uh, to kind of investigate uh, further, I would say. And thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Tommaso, for pushing me a little bit further. Uh, it was a little bit of thinking done on the spot, uh, but I think it's always good to try to clarify your own uh, your own view. Um, and with that, uh, I think I would like to close uh, the webinar today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining, for finding the time, for contributing your expertise uh, and also your opinions, even if a little bit spontaneous at times, even if I pushed you a little bit uh, on certain aspects. Um, it was a pleasure, really, and, uh, and I hope that we will have an opportunity in the future to maybe touch on some of these issues uh, that we have um, initiated uh, to talk about uh, today. And with that, I would also like to uh, thank our viewers and our technician Ernest uh, for uh, being here and for fighting the technical difficulties throughout the last uh, couple of years. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice day.